Okay, so uh, good afternoon and good morning for some of you as well. So today we're just going to discuss about concurrency in Python, which is a really big topic uh, on these days. So I hope for this presentation to just make an impact in your knowledge and of course uh, make some participation about this. So first of all, my presentation, I'm Juan Jose Palacio, just as Arthur mentioned. I'm a senior uh, Python developer. I have been working for almost six years in this like tech environment. I have been working for domains as e-commerce, electronics, uh, fintechs, and now I'm working with mining, but now for cryptos, it's real mining. So yeah, real minerals. So I have been for almost four months uh, in SoftServe, and I'm actually a Colombian, not a Mexican. But yeah, it's almost the same. We are just in, in America. So yeah, I'm a motorcycle lover and a road trip lover. So if you have any uh, like comment after, of course, the, the meeting about, I don't know, something that you want to share, some photos about your motor, for, for motorcycles and stuff like that, count on me for that. Okay, so now that I already present myself, so let's jump into what we came for here. So we are going to discuss about concurrency, uh, about that I just talked. And the first and foremost thing that I will need to share with you is that concurrency is actually not parallelism. Concurrency, concurrency is just the property of a program and an algorithm about where neither of the events can casually affect the other. So let's say, for example, that you have a user and this user will interact with a UI. So while he's pressing buttons and while he's just clicking in some parts of the screen of the browser, of course, these events can interact like a, and can actually affect the others. So this is just a property that will happen same, like events in almost the simultaneous thing. So it's wrongly actually compare and confuse like concurrency with some of the methods to implement it. So it's actually the concept of concurrency when we are trying to solve problems that interact with concurrency, we're going to have like different approaches. One of them will be non-parallel execution where the context of the different, for example, threads will be uh, handled by a manager. And we are just going to do more things, but in the same time. So we are not just uh, like throttling or accelerating the process. What we're just doing is doing literally taking the same time and just making more things. And the other thing is just making the parallel execution where we actually going to accelerate the things because we're going to uh, increase the number of processes or increase the number of executors that are just actually taking action at the same time. So now that we uh, have an idea about the general like aspects of concurrency, I would like to explain why concurrency is needed in, in those days. So as you can see in the chart, we have like the transistors by, by meter uh, square. So actually this is increasing is still uh, uh, in, in those days. However, the, the Moore's law told us that every single year that this uh, number of transistors will be increasing in the PCBs, in the processors, the same thing will happen with the single thread performance. I mean, our programs will be faster. And that was actually happening pretty similar, pretty parallel in the beginning of, of this century. However, uh, the things just still uh, going a bit flat, even still going a bit down. But this doesn't mean that the processors are just uh, not good enough for these days. It just means that uh, it's something different that is happening. And the answer is the number of cores. So now that we have actually a pretty good number of transistors, that we have a really good performance in the single thread like uh, programs, the thing that is happening is actually that the number of cores uh, is still increasing. So this will like um, just highlight one problem is that the cores needs to share a context memory. So these like a uh, memory or these, uh, let's say messages that needs to be shared by the cores will rely on an overhead in the program. An overhead is just a time or a delay that the programs could take to share information between the threads and the physical cores. So now that we have these number of cores, we can allow parallel like execution. So the thing that the single thread performance is just going a bit down, just give us a chance uh, or a challenge to start using all the multiple cores in our program. So that is actually a challenge for new developers to develop new skills or just to maximize the skills for implementing concurrency. 
So now that we understand why do we need concurrency in those days and now that we know about concurrency in general respect, let's just discuss about the different methods that we have available in Python to approach this problem. Okay, so the first one, and I guess that all of you or most of you know about multi-threading because it's actually a transverse uh, term in terms of all the different languages I would say that I know. So multi-threading is actually a preemptive multitasking. Preemptive multitasking means that the operative system will, will be just handling the switch context between the threads. So that will mean that the, literally the operative system can just switch from this thread to other despite the like the program is not waiting for something. So that waiting for something is called IO bound operation. Multi-threading try to solve a case when the program is just not executing poor code, in this case, poor Python code, but when we have just an external service that we need to wait for our response. And that's called an IO bound operation. So talking about some proof of the threads, so something very important about the threads, uh, it's that thread share memory context of the patent process. So when you have a, a program, you can just start spawning new threads and though on all those threads, will share the same context memory. So if you have, for example, a global variable, all the different threads can just include or update, insert new information if that's an object, if that's just a, a JSON structure or something. The different threads can just start literally implementing, updating some uh, some data based on the on the task that this is just accomplishing. So it works best, as I mentioned, for application with with I/O bound operations, and that will tell you why only work best for this kind of operations. So it's actually pretty easy to implement threads, but only with the trade-off that if we don't need a thread-safe code, it's actually pretty simple to just create an spawning of threads based on independent tasks. And when I say that it's actually pretty simple to create a, a, a uh, like this, uh, it's actually pretty simple to implement multi-threading when we don't need a like thread-safe code because the thread-safe code will require some of the locking, for example, for the sharing uh, objects or variables that you have in your program. So it will be in incredible like a non-deterministic behavior if you start like manipulating some shared content between all these threads and it's pretty pretty hard if you don't lock your resources if you don't have like a, a proper a property way to communicate to send messages be between threads it will be very very like a bad situation if you just don't have that kind of of like thread safe code so okay so all these pros of course will just come with a trade-off so the threads share memory context of the pattern process and as you can see we have that as a trade-off but as well as a pro and you may wonder why so as i told you we have like two ways of implementing multi-threading if the thread safe code is required or if not if not it's just super simple to create just threads but if we require thread safe like a code because we have this shared context because we need to have very detailed steps about how to update, I don't know, some connection, some resources into the database, just uh, pull some information from an external API that needs to handle a rate limiting or something. So this will be a trade-off actually, because we need to make sure that the code that we're implementing is just ma making sure of the logs and all the small things that we need to take into account when we are coding threads. Okay, so this will has to do with race condition and synchronization because we need, of course, a, if we have a code that interact with shared resources, we can have this kind of non-deterministic behaviors and really weird stuff because the operative system is just switching the context between threads when he wants, not when the operation of IO bound is happening actually in all the cases, but literally based on some poly and some priority policies of the uh, operative system. Okay, so it has another trade-off in the normal trade-off that all the Python engineers know is the GIL limitation. So not going too deep on the GIL because that has not to do with the conversation of today. The GIL limitation will just uh, try to release memory in a thread safe way. So the GIL is actually pretty important. And despite some people are just complaining a lot of the GIL because it only allowed the SQL execution of Python code. 
It, of course, protects some resources to keep a very, very performant single thread program. So not just talking uh, too much about the yield limitation, just take in mind that it's literally limiting the number, the different threads to run code uh, in parallel. So we just have to run the uh, lines literally in a sequential way. Okay, and also have a high complexity to write secure thread safe code because all the things that I have been mentioning, like the locking, the queues, if you want to, I don't know, for example, to protect your, the resources of your hardware, so you need to have a pool. So yes, we are going to just touch in the general aspects multi-threading and we'll be focusing on processing and async IO for your information. Okay, so what's behind scenes? So I just want to present like this uh, simple uh, like uh, diagram flow. So you will see that the threads will be just sharing the same context memory and they will be spawned by the same like pattern process. And in the time they will just overlap the weighting of the IO processing. And then just the, it will be just given the response in the pattern process as well. So this is just a diagram in the time perspective. Okay, so now let's just stop talking and just stop just making what we what we like, which is code. So we have two single functions, a synchronous function and a concurrent function that make the same thing, call on API. So we are going to call uh, an, like a, a same number of calls to that API for the synchronous and for the concurrent. And we are just going to measure the time that we take for this synchronous execution and for the concurrent execution. So you can see that at the bottom, we have the locks and we take we took 10 seconds to call the API this number of times, which are actually 10 times. And we took the 10 times less time uh, for the concurrent execution. So here you can literally check what is the like the benefit of the IO bound uh, processes because the API is just a third party service that we need to make a connection to a socket to a network. So it will just literally spend time, but not uh, coding time, well, sorry, not execution time. Literally the thread will be just waiting for you to respond. So that's the approach that we need to take with threads for IO operations. Okay, and this is all for the multi-threading. Since I told you, we are just going to focus on the multi-processing and the and async IO. Okay, so now let's start uh, discussing about multi-processing. So it's actually uh, another approach to handle concurrency in Python, and the method of here and the method here is just spawn a bunch of new processes with new interpreter executor. And this fact is just very good because the interpreters. Uh, every single interpreter will have their own GIL, so that will represent a real parallel programming because we won't have the limitation of the GIL. Of course, we will have, but per interpreter. But since we have different interpreters, we will have uh, like just literally real parallel programming. So we are going to rely on the operating system most of the coordination because we don't need to set the core, the physical core that we want to share or that we want to fork the whole code, the whole, the whole like Python model. Literally, the operating system, we will, uh, we're going to rely all this like communication, uh, pipe, and all the things that has to do to start a new process in our machine. Also, we so the code that we did literally need to do is just pretty simple compared to the whole background that is back, that is happening behind scenes. Also, it works best for application that is actually a CPU intensive processes. So, uh, in like in in other words, we are going to be running code. Python pure code all the time, and we are not need to like have this IO operation where other like services, we are just waiting for here for them. So literally, we can just optimize programs that are just calculating something or just making some that kind of stuff. So we have of course some trade off as always. So the thing and the the first and more important is that we won't have shared context memory. Every single process will have their own stack, their own like uh, objects in a, in like the scope of their of their of their process. So we cannot just define a global variable and have there and have like it share for all the processes. It's not happening like that. And also the communication between processes will require additional work. So we don't have a shared context memory, but we can just share, of course, some objects uh, in this like uh, in this communication. So we of course will need to just uh, add additional work to do that. And also too much overhead 
due to data serialization. So all the information that we are going to pass from the patent process to the child to the child process will require uh, a pickling, which is just a serialization to make the uh, the Python objects in just to chain of bytes. So that's something important that we cannot pass everything to a process to a new process. The the objects should be actually serializable, serializable, and well, not everything is serializable. So yeah. Okay, and another trade-off is that multi-core machines are very, very expensive. So yeah, just to take that in mind. And of course, I'm talking about like hosted machines. And of course, if you want to test in your computer, it's actually allowed. But I'm just talking about uh, hosted machines. Okay, so what's behind the scenes? So we have actually a single threaded program that is working in a normal way. However, the good thing here is that we're just going to have multiple interpreters. And if we just take a look based on the time, we are just going to like execute code at, at the same time, having of course the multiple interpreters. Okay, so now let's just in, jump into a single uh, example to just highlight the power of the multiprocessing. So here we are just going to, instead of calling API, we're just uh, make some intense calculation. I can share you the code if you want to check this, but it's literally a very intense calculation. So we will have the synchronous like approach where we are just going to define a list <clears throat> using this. And we're just going to, of course, ex execute the code. Then we're just going to have the same code, but using parallel approach. So we have the spawning of processes. You can see that I'm doing the same the same number of like processing and calculations five times. I'm just calculating it, but with the different that I'm spawning processes. So here the process, uh, the multiprocesses, the multiprocess API will just give us the like the the method start, which is literally to start the process, and it's actually pretty similar, almost the same. If we compare, for example, the API that provides multi-threading they are the same. So with star, we are just going to start the processes and with join, we're just going to wait until all the processes finish. So that's why we have like these two loops. And the same thing, we're just going to measure the execution time. So with the synchronous execution, we took five seconds to make the calculations. And for the multi-process execution, we uh, incredible, like just saved the four, almost four seconds of time. And this is actually just for, uh, using like some processes, but the hosted machine can have even more than five processes. So we can still improve more of this code. So let's jump into some other question that we may have. So we, some of you may ask if we could approach this problem with multi-threading. And well, let's just try. So we define a function that do the same, the intense calculation, but with the difference that we know we're going to use the thread API or the thread, or the thread model. And we're just going to do the same. As you can see, we have the same like methods for, for the different objects. Uh, and here you can find at the end, we're just executing everything. Here you can find that the synchronous execution uh, took five seconds. The multi-train execution just took a bit more uh, due to the overhead of spanning, of spanning, spawning more threads. And of course, the multi threading execution took less time. So you can see, and we can highlight that this kind of like uh, approach for intense calculations or just for pro for programs that will be running and that will be locking the, all the time the GIL, the best approach is multiprocessing. Okay, so now we we have uh, another like topic, which is multiprocessing pools. So this will happen when you want, of course, to have a pool of processes, a pool of workers, and you want to reuse them. And so this multiprocessing model for like comes with a very good API, which is the pools. So the pools object is just that since you know each process will will be carefully kept in an isolated like way by the operated system so the interprocess the communication actually start taking very important considerations so some of the benefits of using pools is that pools can seamlessly hide the way that is moved between processes because with pools we will be a, a code of course an example but just let me finish this so pools can seamlessly hide the way that data is just transported between processes so it's pretty simple to pass just information between the patent process and all the different childs i mean we don't need a for loop that needs to just loop into all the different let's say data or object that we have prepared for that uh like 
execution that we need to improve and also we can hand we can with pool we can handle complexity because it's pretty simple to write even multiple processing in just a single piece of code and also this is especially very very like designed for when we have a very uh, like a bunch of different uh, ad hoc tasks and they are just very simple tasks that can be easily mapped to a, uh, like an iterator that will have a bunch of items that needs to apply that same function. So stop talking and let's just check a, a piece of code. So now we have a simple code here that will be trying to, well, that will be calculating the prime factors or 41,000 numbers between 100 million and 1,000 million. So this is actually pretty a pretty good example. And here we have the fine or pool. The good thing with pools is that they can be defined with context with context managers. So it's pretty simple to define them. So here we will have our pool, and we here are passing as argument to our pool object that we have the CPU count, which is just a function that returns the number of cores that we have defined for our machine. So as you can see, we have our pools and these will just give us the number of workers, as I told you. So we are going to just map and the map is literally very similar to the map function that provides Python in, his in its standard library. And what we're going to do is just literally map the iterator that we have, which is this like array of, of numbers with the prime factor function, which is just the, the function that, that make the intense calc. So this pool will just take care of all the execution and the communication with the different processes. They will be, this will be even taking care of the, re, 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 like reusing the workers that we have, because of course we don't have a processor with, with 41,000, 41,000 of cores. So we are going to just reuse the, the, the process, uh, the process, the processor, sorry, or the workers. And at the end, what this will return is just a very like straightforward way to return a top as a tuple all the primes number that we calculated based on the array that we just created. And despite we have these very big calculus, we just take 1.3 seconds to just make this calculus. Okay, so you may wonder, okay, Juan, so we always not like need uh, just a mapping function to map like an iterable with a list of sorry, with a, with a function, we sometimes need a processes that will be interacting with different and independent like a task. So for that case, we have the queues. So queues is actually a, a space of shared memory in the operating system. Normally we have several ways of communicate processes. It could be a pipe and a pipe will be just a duplex communication between only two processes. So with the pipe, the limitation is that we can have only one producer and only one like receiver or consumer. But with queues, the benefits of queues is that we can have multiple producers or multiple consumers. And let's try the thing in the queues just as a way to send messages. So we are going to send messages in a queue and some other people, some other services will just consume that messages. So some of other benefits is that we can pass objects very, very simple in a similar way. And of course we can share these queue objects between the processes and also just as I mentioned, we are going to take these queues just as a message passing functionality. And since we are going to pass messages, we are not going to share like information for all the different process. So that will mean that we don't need to worry about the lock on the sharing like context. So let's take a look and we have three pieces of code here and all of them are just interacting. So the first one will be just create an interaction of a producer and a consumer, as I was telling you. So here we're just going to define a, a function that will be producing items. So we will have just a, a for loop that will be looped three times and we are going to produce a random item uh, and these will be the item, literally. And then we are going to use our queue, which is a, uh, the, the unique argument that receives our function. And we are going to enqueue that message. Remember that queues are, has to do with messaging. So we are going to enqueue our message and any consumer now can like, will have the ability to 
to like take this item and just consume the the value. So here we are just uh, cons uh, like uh, enqueuing in enqueuing the value, and just to remind and just to remind like a uh, small thing since we are just producing some values, we can have like a process or something. So that's why I added this slip value. So just to take you in mind that we are going to produce a value between zero and one. We are going to sleep like that kind of seconds, and then we are just going to enqueue the value. And at the end, what we're going to do is just notify the consumers that we're not going to say nothing else with this known execute uh, with this known message. So here, here we're going to define the consumer function, which receives as well the queue. And what we're going to do is just in an infinite loop, we're just going to start consuming the different items that the producer will send. So here you can say that we that we can define a timeout because this get operation will literally wait until we have something. If we define a timeout, we are not going to just return a default value. We are because uh, the code will trigger an exception, and this exception will be an empty an, an empty exception. So the consumer will just give up because yeah, we wait enough, and we are just going to try to get another one. If we got something, we are just going to wonder if this is a none because. That will mean that the producer is one go to like produce nothing else. But if that's not the case, we're just going to inform that we got something and we are going to show what was the something that we got. So here we go. Uh, we can uh, sorry Absolutely. for the interruption. We have one question in our chat. Can you check or I should read? Absolutely. Let's go check. Those queues are FIFO. Yes, those queues actually it represents a, a FIFO structure. For those that doesn't know what is a FIFO, is first message that input in the queue will be the first message that output the queue. So yes, that's correct. This is a FIFO interaction. Okay, so let's continue. Now, okay, there's another question. Okay, good, thanks. <clears throat> Okay, now that we have uh, everything just defined, what we're going to do is just start our queue, which will be the share context that the different process will have. And then we are just going to start a new processes. So as I told you, this is really, really benefit because we are going to have different processes. So now is the where the queues uh, start taking action. So we're going to start the process of the consumer sending the queue. We're going to just start that process. And then we're go just going to define the producer as well. We're just going to start both and we are just going to wait until both processes just finish. So as you can see, we just highlight that they start running. Then the producer will just add a new item. So since this is less than 0.5 seconds, we're just going not to trigger the timeout. So the consumer will just take the value immediately. Same thing here, we didn't trigger the timeout, but here the consumer just triggered the timeout because he gave up waiting. And that's because we generate a value more than 0.5 seconds. Then the consumer uh, got that uh, item and the producer is just done. So he send the non as a flag and yeah that's uh, how we can interact between multiple processes and how we communicate easily with queues okay now we're just going to discuss about the last but not least uh, method to treat concurrency in python which is a sync io which is a like a state of art here in python it's not too like new of course but a lot of the popular uh, like libraries in Python has not migrated their nature or their behavior to asynchronous. So yeah, let's start just talking about this. Okay, so as you remember, we discussed it uh, for multi-trading as a preemptive multitasking. So see, here the difference is that async IO is cooperative multitasking, and that will mean that we're not going to rely on the operating system, the context switch between threads, but we are just going to rely on the same program. So the first thing and the most important is that we are just going, or besides this, of course, we're going to rely on a single process, on a single thread, the responsibility of the context switch. So that will mean that we will only have one thread uh, in different, like for the multi-threading that we have a spawning of multiple threads. So here we're just going to have a single thread that will be responsible for switching into the different task. So you may wonder, okay, so if a single thread is controlling that, and of course the code will have these like flags to notify that they will be just waiting for something, who are going to execute that? And I think IO has another very important thing, which is the event loop and is the real executor of this task. So the, the event loop 
will be, as I told you, the main responsible for switching before all the tasks, for all the schedule features that we have. So yeah, just take that in mind, the difference between the cooperative multitasking and the preemptive. So let's talk about some pros. So some pros is that we don't need now to rely on the context switch for the operated system. And this is good because now we can optimize these times. As I told you in the multi-threading, the operated system can switch the context between threads when he wants. So if literally we're just executing a pure Python instruction, the, the code will be switched to another thread. So here, those like uh, not necessary switching won't happen because we will have the ability to tell the code, to tell the event loop when he needs to wait for something and he can take care of other, of other tasks. So some of other pros is that memory, uh, so we have a memory optimization, of course, since we only have one thread per execution. Uh, different to multi-threading, for example, that we will have a spawn of threading, and despite they are sharing the same context memory, they will reserve a stack of memory for their own execution. So we will, uh, of course, optimize memory a lot. So we will have also an existing, uh, well, we won't have no deterministic behavior just like threads have because of this thing of the switch uh, of the switch context when the operative system want. So it will be easier to debug. It will be even easier to write cleaner code because it's actually almost the same thing as writing synchronous code. Well, or almost the same. So of course, as always, we have some trade-offs and it's that thing that all, that all the like libraries that we want to use for a sync IO needs or not needs must be a synchronous library. Of course, if you want to take take advantage of the of the power of a synchronous a synchronous, but if not, I guess that you what you need to do is just freeze the event loop because the since I uh, since we know the this will have only one thread, and if we use libraries that doesn't let now the event loop that he can wait for execution or something that he can take a like uh, something else, we are going to just lock or block the event loop. And of course, we just lose the whole asynchronous behavior and the powerful that this just gave, give to us. Other trade-off is that uh, when you start uh, like this asynchronous programming, like uh, knowledge or just um, cur the learning curve, you may know, know you may know very good you may not know very good what is like this this kind of notation about a sync and a wait so some of the objects that are awaitable won't uh, won't be used in a proper way if you don't have an, a better good knowledge of this so you will start thinking that all the functions that you are defining will be coroutines a coroutine is just something that is defined with that flag of a sync i will show you in a moment but you will start thinking that everything can be awaited, that everything can we can can be a sync, and there are just some things that actually not require this kind of notation because a sync I/O will be a like very performant for I/O bound processes as well. This won't be helpful for CPU intensive operations because of the GIL. So yes, now that we know about it, so it's actually pretty easy to block the even loop for developers that, of course, doesn't have a, a, a pretty good knowledge about the features. So even you can just await something, but if the core routine is not a task and scheduled task, you can freeze the like the concurrent operation of other tasks that will be in the same function. Or if you have something that doesn't have the nature of asynchronous, you will literally block the entire event loop. So some of the objects that we have uh, that are awaitable are the core routines, the task, and the features. There are some others, but we're just going to focus on them. So behind scenes, what I what is actually happening is just a single process, a single thread that is sharing some of the resources. And we are just looping into the different tasks and we're just waiting for, of course, the response of IO operations. And that's how we can just have like a, this overlapping of the times between requests or just IO operations. Okay, so I would like to ask you guys how much time this will take so I guess that since we are using the single like a uh, standard library, which is time, all of you know that this will take three seconds, right? I hope that every one of you uh, like just 
properly uh, answer that question. That this will take three seconds. We're just using trace, which is a, a cool way to identify all the calls uh, into our function. So let's just fix that. So we're going to apply a sync IO uh, and the notation to, to fix that. So I would like to you guys start answering in the chat how much time this will take. One second, right? Because we are using uh, a sync IO. So we are just defining a core routine. We're just gathering for the core routine. And of course we are waiting. So we're just relying on the event loop to make the different way, uh, like calls, right? So can you please guess how many time this will take, please? Can just give some couple seconds. One sec, one sec. Okay, one sec, three sec. Some people say three sec, okay. Let's see how it goes. So it actually took three seconds. And that's uh, because of the because of the fact that I was telling you that sometimes we are here we're actually not blocking the even loop because we are just awaiting actually a coroutine. But that's the thing that this is a coroutine and a coroutine will just be a waitable and this will tell the even loop that the next lines in the current coroutine won't be executed until this is finished. So the better way or the best way to fix this is just creating task. So a task is literally a wrap, a wrap it of the core routine. So this will tell the, the event loop that he can even take more than tasks that share the same context in the current core routine. So as you can see, this will be actually, despite we have the different weights, this will be executed in a concurrent, like in a concurrent way by the uh, event loop. So yeah for your information okay so let's just have a, a simple example before finishing of discussing about a sync io so what we're going to do is that we are going to schedule some sleepers some people to sleep and what the the main point that i just want to tell you is that this is actually not necessary fifo i mean first input first output because since we are just taking task uh, in a synchronous way, some of the people that will like sleep less will just wake up first. So here we just have the gather and the gather method of async IO just give us the opportunity to take any future and just tell the event loop that all the different, it could be an iterable. So all the different items that we are passing will be of course approached as task. Because even if we pass some, some coroutines internally gather will convert or will just take all those coroutines into simple uh, task. So here, if we go to the sleepers function, we're just going to create task for how many, for two, people that we are going that we are going to put into sleeping and we are just going to define random sleep which is actually a core routine and we're just going to define the delay or the time that he will be that they will be sleeping so here we'll have the task for the two people that will be sleeping and we're just going to populate this list this list comprehension with task and at the end we just get we just pass those tasks together to be approached by the event loop in a concurrent perspective. So here we can take that look in the logs. So we are just taking two people to bed, the people with zero is lead for two and 72 seconds. And the first and the people and the people and the people and the person number one just is lead for almost four seconds. So as you can see, if we are like uh, trying to think in a, in a synchronous way, I guess that it will, <clears throat> it will happen that the zero will, will wake up uh, earlier. And it actually what happens because the people in these uh, circumstances sleep less. But if actually the, first, the, 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 people, the person number one sleep less, it will have been uh, awake first. So yes, that's actually all for the, for the different methods of concurrency that we have on Python. On Python. And as a conclusion, I just want to highlight and that for IO bomb problems, there is actually a general rule in Python, and is if you can use a sync IO 
please do it because is the state of art they actually have a very very like active community and all the different like services libraries that actually doesn't have support right now for async io they are having a plan to support that in future so that's the only thing if you can as use async io please use it if not because of some like behaviors because you have a, lot, a bunch of different legacy code that is very hard to migrate from synchronous to asynchronous just instead of that use threads and as the same thing if you have cpu bound problems uh, well you saw that with the sync io and with multi-threading we don't have a actually resolution for that at all so just keep using multi-processing for the cpu bound problems and yes, those are the image links. And now I want to jump into the project demo, but not before uh, of that, just maybe, maybe making sure that you guys have any good questions or something that you want to share. We have maybe some five minutes to answer question, question, questions in case that you have. So what should be a good use case for using Celery? Okay, that's a good question. So Celery is actually something different. Celery is, is normally used to define some workers, some background workers. And that is actually another approach on concurrency because you will have something similar to the pools that we define for the multiprocessing. So you will have these workers and the pool will just take into, like will take care of them reusing this. So Celery actually has a very, very good approach when you have, for example, a, I don't know, for, for example, when you have a, a WebSocket server and this web server, it's in charge to, let's say, send emails to the users that are subscribed to the newsletter, and you will have a, a task in Celery every single month that will trigger a code in Python, and that code in Python will be run in a background task in Celery. So Celery is pretty, pretty good to not only, of course, to host background workers, the Celery is really big, but for the, for the, for the like, scope that we're discussing celery is very very good for that kind of approach when you can relay on a background task and you don't need to like receive a response or return a value in exact the same time so that will be a very good approach when you need to use celery thank you so much in terms of performance is there any advantage in using a sync io over multi-threading for io bone task or is just about syntax and better API. So yes, as I mentioned, that's a good question, Sebastian. Uh, so I think IO uh, has a better like approach because we can save memory uh, since it will use only one single thread. We're just going to save memory and also the code will be uh, like more readable for the person since we are almost uh, like writing uh, synchronous code. And in my opinion, multi-threading has all these things about locking, queues, and adult, on a, about a bunch of different stuff. But of course, uh, Async.io as well has these kind of things, but they are rarely used because Async.io doesn't, has, doesn't have that nature. So yes, in, that, in those, and long story short, Async.io will be better than multi-threading because it will save memory. It will be easier to write, in my opinion, compared to multi-threading in some of the general cases. And it will, of course, just not has that a uh, let's say undeterministic behavior because of the preemptive multitasking that is relying on the operating system the switch context between threads how about thread pool executor that's good that's a very good question so the thread pool executor is actually coming from the core from the futures like api which provides actually uh, the standard library as well. And the thread pool executor is actually the same as just defining pools that came from the multi-threading multi, multi uh, API. The only difference is that the thread pool executor, since it comes from the future API, we, it's literally easy to switch between threads and, and process. So we will have the thread pool executor as a, let's say, as a context manager. So we can define our code using the thread pool executor with our like thread workers that will be, of course, being reused by the pool. But at the same time, if we are actually not sure if the code that we're testing is IO bound or CPU bound, we can switch very, very easily because it has actually the, the, the capacity to have the same methods between the thread pool executor and the process pool executor. So the main purpose of the thread pool executor, in my opinion, is literally to switch very easy because in terms of functionality is exactly the same uh, of having a pool normally. So 
this thread pool executor, just to <laughs> emphasize, is the ability to have threads into pools and also executors. So executors also have like a deeper, let's say, explanation in this like concurrency world. So I will let you investigate about executors because we have like different of them. For example, the even loop is actually an executor in a single IO. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I guess that we can just jump into the project demo. Let's give uh, just some couple seconds in case that anyone has another question. Okay, cool. So let's jump into <clears throat> the project demo. Okay, so the main idea of this code is that we are going to download a number of Wikipedia pages and we are going to just use Beautiful Soap. But for those that doesn't know about Beautiful Soap, it's just a, a model that like literally allow us to scrap any like content of a, of a site, of course, hopefully in HTML. And what we're going to do is using Beautiful Soap, we're just going to scrape the page title and we're going to store the value in a CSV file, in this case, CSV file, which is a tab separated value file. So yeah, we now have this synchronous code, synchronous code, and our task is see how it is going right now. So we have the main function, all these things are just logging and measuring the time that we're going to take to execute this main function. So we're going to scrape, scrap a 40 pages and we're just going to store everything in this output file. So this is the function, the main function, the main function that will be in charge to scrape the, uh, the pages based on the output file that we gave and also the number of pages that we gave. So here we will have uh, some like logging to indicate that some process is starting to scrape uh, pages. And inside this, we are just going to have another function uh, annotated. And we are going to just take into a, a look into this function. So this is where we start interacting with some IO operations because when we open a file, we're just going to uh, like communicate with the, with the uh, hard drive and of course that will require a communication in the hardware the processor and the memories of the computer so here we have the first io operation a file manipulation and here we are just going to iterate in the number of pages remember that is 40 and we're just going to start scrapping uh, for every single page so as i as you can see i'm sending the the manager of the manager like the file manager uh, of course, to be uh, used inside this function, which is a scrape, a scrape page and write file. So if we check this function, remember that this function is inside a loop. So this function, what it's going to do is to request to Wikipedia. Wikipedia has actually a cool, a cool like a uh, resource, which is just call an, a random uh, page. So what we're going to have is just a random response from our Wikipedia page. And I'm just uh, defining this because sometimes Wikipedia can uh, just stop or stop us from throttling. Throttling is just is that we're just literally bunching a different bunch of, re of requests to a web server. So yeah, sometimes we can just have a different uh, responses. So that's why I just take this. And also, what we're going to do here is just use beautiful soap, uh, as, I, as I told you, to find the first title of the site and use write the title in this way. And remember, since this is a tab separated file, we're just going to include a tab. And yeah, that's actually the function. And then we are just going to start looping into that functionality. So I guess that you notice it that we're not using concurrent like approaches for this. So what we're going to do is just uh, run the function, sorry, run the code and start checking how is everything. So it's telling me that the process one is starting and that we need to wait. So here we are scrapping Wikipedia. We're just literally calling a bunch of our random titles 40 times. And at the end, what we're going to have is just a file uh, with this information and we're going to have the time that this took. So in general, this took almost uh, 23 seconds, 22 and 41 seconds. So it's actually taking a lot of time just to uh, just to like scrape uh, this kind of uh, this kind of number of page. I mean, it's only 40. So you may wonder how can we, of course, uh, approach the situation. So of course, this should be approached in a concurrent in a concurrent. Sorry, yeah, in a concurrency way, but 
I guess that is not super evident for the whole cases. So what I want to do before jumping in to fix this, I want to profile this. I want to see where are we wasting our time? Where are we like spending the time that literally the code is uh, executing the code? Because for me, it's pretty straight. It's pretty clear that the processor just can make billions of instructions per second. So it doesn't make sense for me that we can only spend forty, uh, sorry, twenty seconds requesting forty pages. Okay, so this is the Python way about how can we check the execution, but this is a horrible way in this chart. So let's just jump into a very user friendly way to check this. Let's just remove the grid and let's start checking the start of the execution. So here we have the main and you know that this will take, of course, the 100 percentage of the time. I will just zoom this a bit because I know that you may not like uh, check it. So yeah, we are just spending the 90 percentage of the time because of course we are running this main function and this like wrap everything, but we can just start going down. So start scrapping, take almost the same time, the same thing for get and scrape pages, the same thing here. And what we are going to do is that we split this function since this has a loop into different times for the file manager and also for the like for the uh, request that we're dying. So now we can pretty, pretty check, uh, easily check, sorry, that we're spending 91% of the time just waiting for the network. Because if we go deeper in this, we are going to, oh, let me just move in. Oh, yeah. We are just going to check that most of the time is actually making new connections. So this is where we can double check that actually the time will be executing, just making some socket connections with the network. And that's actually not, that has not to do with our code. So here we can check that the main, like the main time that our code is just spending time is on the connection with the network. So now we got a better good approach where we can just optimize that we can just make our code concurrently because we're just waiting here. And actually, we're just calling this several times because other other problem will be that, OK, yeah, we're waiting uh, into a network, where, but we are just calling this one time. It, it won't worth to optimize it or make this something concurrently because we're just calling this one time. Since we're just calling this a lot of times, we do have an opportunity to speed up our code. OK, so let's just go just let's just go again to the code and let's start making this. Uh, a bit concurrently. So since we have limited time, I would like to, of course, to make this uh, for you, very, I mean, to start coding for you, but since we have a limited time, I do have the, the things that we have to do right now in other tab. So I would just reading the to do's that as a, as a Python developer, what you should do and the approach that you should take. So first of all, I will just rely on the processing at the end, just to show you something. So we're going to start from the end to the beginning. So we are going to start here. Okay, so here we are going to add just a session uh, for a client and request. And this will just be something like this because a session needs to be shared between the different tasks that we have for the multi-concurrent, for the concurrency approach. So this function will look something like this after we <clears throat> after we just uh, fix it. So as you can see, it's the same thing. We're just requesting the same Wikipedia, but now we're defining a client session and that client session will be using the notation, the async notation. As you can see, we're just using some context manager uh, here. And the fact that we're just defining the assign is that this will be an awaitable object. So same thing here, we're just having the client session. We are just going to request for to Wikipedia and it's actually the same code we're just going to have some like uh, abilities to use the await since this is an awaitable uh, object. We can have awaitable methods. So we are going to return the content of the page using the text method, which, which is actually uh, a property. And this will return the content. And using beautiful sub, we're just going to scrap this. Beautiful sub is actually pretty, pretty, pretty fast. So we don't need to like uh, use asynchronously in, in this thing. So here we are just using the async IO and just let me, of course, start importing. Okay, great. So now we have async IO. Also, we are using AO HTTP, which is another library 
that uh, rely uh, that give us the ability to make a uh, asynchronous request. So it is AO HTTP. We have it here as well. And great, this is actually how it will be, how it looks like in an asynchronous perspective. So the script function. So then we're just going to do the other one. Oh, we just didn't delete this. We're just going to uh, return to the other function that calls that function. So we're just going to check where it's called and it's called here. And what we are going to do is just use AO files with this context manager that is an awaitable object to of course make a thread save and a process save approach of the like handling of our files. So actually uh, there is a problem with these IO files and it's that files are actually not fully uh, saved to be in an event loop. I mean, they will block the event loop in some, in some cases, they are not fully asynchronously because of the nature. Some of the operations that the operating system need to use to handle files are just not <laughs> impossible to avoid. So yeah, I just want to mention uh, a curious thing about the AO files. So this will function will looks after the the like the refactor like this the same context manager the same context manager just using the AU files and then we're just going to have some features that will take advantage of the synchronous behavior but because record the remember that if we wait for every single core routine we're just going to tell the event loop that we need to wait until this finish and then we are using AO files which is another we can now delete the request because it's not necessary now another asynchronous library so AO files we got it here so just return here so now we have these using AO files and something really really important is that we need to start the event loop so let's just start the event loop very very simple in this function here so we have the start scrapping function and as you can see uh, this is the core routine because now we have a core routine here this is the core routine that we will execute to scrap all the wikipedia pages so here we're going to just <clears throat> oh sorry we're just going to define the even loop and we're just going to run until this finish this run is literally something beautiful that the Python 3.7 uh, support include because uh, before we need to start the execution of the even loop, then we need to get the even loop and set some policies. If you were on Windows, for example, I think they're still required, but since we're not on Windows, let's just avoid that. And at the end, we just need to execute that in a method from the async IO. And that run a uh, method is literally doing all those things for us. So now literally we do have our code already for a concurrent execution so what we can do is just maybe some other approach but before of that i just want to double check if the code is running because of course uh, the first time it won't never run so let's just check okay so now you can see that the code was just incredible uh, like uh, speed it up so you can see that all the all the 40 uh, titles were actually requested in once in 1.8 seconds so we pass it from almost 20 uh, 23 seconds to 1.8 seconds so it's a huge increase in the performance so that's the best way that we can just think in how can we uh, like implement these kind of things so let's go into to, to to i don't know let's install i don't know making 500 requests but before wikipedia a uh, rate limited us what I want to do is just make some uh, pool execution here to see if we can speed up this in, a, in some way. So what we are going to do is just define a pool, a pool execution. As we check in the presentation, we are just going to use multiprocessing and we are just going to use a pool of workers to handle the different things. So here I'm just making some like uh, math, math things because of course the idea is to split this kind of uh like pages that we need to scrape in the different processors so let's just import multiprocessing of course and let's just return here i think we have a typo here yeah 
So here, what it, what I'm doing is just relying on relying a number of pages divided between the number of CPUs that we have assigned or that we have available. So we're just going to literally loop into the different uh, into the different processors to start a new round of scrapping. And we are going to use map. You remember map? This is star map. And the good thing of a star map is that they allow us to pass multiple arguments. Map only allow us to pass one argument. And since, he, since here we need a tuple to pass the number of page, the number of page that every single process will handle, the output file, and also the process number, what we're going to do is pass three arguments. So that's why we need a star map. So I want you to take care of this number. 1.84 seconds. So let's start the, the scrapping with multiprocessing and using a zinc IO. Okay, so we're we're starting some multi, uh, like different processes, and yeah, this is just running and running and running. But why? I mean, <laughs> this is running actually very very good. And we since we increased a lot the number of like uh, requests, of course, this increased the time as well. But what happen if we still do 40? Do you think that this will improve since now we are using multi-processing? Multi We're spawning a bunch of processes and handling the asynchronous request in every single one. Do you think it will improve? Let's check. So we are using 40 and actually it does. It does, but <clears throat> not too much. It, despite we're using 10 different processes, as you can see, we, are, we have 10 different processes and it is not actually improving a lot and this is because some of the approaches that we're using so remember the io file like a library that i told you that is not fully fully like asynchronously it will be process safe and threat safe so we can we are going to lock the resource uh, to only one process one single thread will be just interacting with it and also we will have the overhead because of the share, the, the shared resources in the processes. So that's one of the cons of the multiprocesses that we will be sharing a lot of resources and that will cause an overhead. So yes, guys, that's a lot to not extend my presentation more. Thank you so much for coming here and for just supporting the Python community. It was a pleasure to have in this conversation with you. And just let me know if you have any kind of question. If you want the code, the project, the slides, just let me know. I can pass them to you very, very quickly. Thank you so much for your attention. Juan, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really useful. And thank you so much for preparing uh, this presentation and for performing for our community. And I hope it was not your last performance for our community. Thank you. Thank you. And dear participants, Bye -bye. Small, small kindly reminder, please don't forget to spend 10 seconds of your life to fill in our feedback form. And of course, in case you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Juan on Teams. And I hope Juan will answer all your questions. Absolutely. So yeah, have a good have a good weekend. Have a good Juan, have a good day. And of course, have a good life. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for your time. Bye.